University in Natural Resources. Um, she has a Master's of Science already uh, in Library and Information Science from the Catholic University of America. And many of you knew her, or I'm guessing some of you knew her, um, as the Science and Health Librarian here at San Jose State for, for a number of years. Yes. Um, which prompts me to call that a distinguished career because that's a Thank you. whole lot of work you got to do to appreciate that. To be successful in a career like that. So we were really excited to see her application come to us. Um, before that, she was actually a, a science librarian also at George Mason University. Correct. So time even before that. Um, if you look at her CV that we have, I just cracked open the file that uh, we have you know, from when they apply to the program and it's something that we look at and we give thumbs up or thumbs down to students. In this case, it's a thumbs up. And we put that file away. We never look at it again. Huh. So it's kind of fun to go back to that file and see what people were thinking they were going to do before. I mean, boy, I wish I could look back at my application for my PhD program. I had no idea probably what I was doing at that point. But uh, it, it's really neat because it actually is a very close fit to what she actually intended to come here to do work on. So if you read through her application, she was interested in citizen science. Correct. And the application of volunteers to going out and data collection and meaning making. Which Correct. Is kind of still in, in the thesis here in many ways. Um, I was thinking about the projects you talked about you wanted to study from kind of a top-down approach to citizen science and looking at bird banding projects and watershed health. And I think there was a, a threat of going up to Portland at one point to do some <laughs> research up there. So there's all these different uh, themes that kind of carry through huh. the letter. It's really fun to read that. Gosh, thing. I have um, forgotten all those things. <laughs> well, some, some other things, just to know, I, if you look at her CV, she's already got a dozen publications. She's got several dozen conference presentations that she's been doing. So that's why, again, I keep saying this is uh, great to see uh, the culmination of, of a new career, in a way, and a new uh, yeah. thread of learning that she's been able to weave through this uh, master's defense. So that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to hand it over to Christina or Tina uh, now, and uh, look forward to hearing uh, people's comments at the end and talk itself. Thank you, okay. Dustin. Well, welcome everybody. It's very good to see you all here from various aspects of my life. That's really quite exciting. Today um, I am going to tell you about, this is my thesis defense, and I'm going to tell you about the work that I did um, wilder with wilderness park volunteers, and I did a qualitative case study of meaning and sustainability. It's not moving. It was doing just fine before. Let's try it. It's probably because you have it open up. And I'll just restart it real quick. When in doubt, restart. It went to sleep. Probably. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Good. Okay. So before I get started talking for my 45 minutes, I wonder, I'm wondering something about you all. So how many of you have done volunteers in a park, an outdoor organization, or any kind of volunteer organization? Oh my goodness, okay, <laughs> wonderful. I love to see that. And you may hear some things that ring a bell with you. So I would like to hear about that afterwards. You know, what resonated with you in this? So are you hearing me okay in the back row? Okay. So the reason that I was interested in this work is that we know that in an increasingly urbanized and wired world that people just do not have the same opportunity to interact with nature on a daily business that they once had. We also know that humans benefit from interacting with nature and that environmental understanding can be strengthened through direct contact with the natural world. Visitors to state parks spend time in nature, and they're able to learn through that about the value of nature. Unfortunately, the California state park system is underfunded and understaffed, and this has been a long time problem. I'm sorry. Okay. 
Now, volunteer programs in parks actually provide supplemental staffing and they do it for all, almost all the things that park rangers or park aides do, including visitor services, visitor safety, park maintenance, and interpretive services for school groups. So the first thing that I'd like to do is come to an agreed understanding of what volunteerism means in terms of this research here. Uh, Music and Wilson are scholars of volunteerism and they've done research and they also have developed this, uh, this definition of volunteerism. It's work without financial compensation under the auspices of an organization. It's instrumental in helping provide the underfunded governmental and nonprofit agencies services and it's essential in um, helping agencies meet their mission. Snyder and Omoto are two other scholars in volunteerism and they um, are they again part of an agreed upon definition of what a volunteer is. They act on the basis of their own volition. They contribute over a period of time so instead of being like an emergency volunteer this definition of volunteer shows that people contribute in, a, in a, a standing basis and people expect to meet their personal goals or, their, or express their personal values by volunteering. So Snyder and Emoto say there are two main questions in volunteering. Why do people volunteer and what sustains their volunteering? I took that to heart. Snyder and Emoto have developed, there are really no theories of volunteering. Um, a lot of the research on volunteering comes out of psychology, other research comes out of sociology, and there is some from economics, but there's no overarching theory of volunteering. But there are some frameworks that are useful, particularly if you're working in a sociology uh, within a sociology um, framework. So Snyder and Emoto talk about the levels of analysis at the, from the individual level to the societal level. I'm not going to go over this whole chart with you. And then they also talk about what happens um, to, to persuade people to volunteer, what are their experiences, and what are the consequences of volunteering. And all of those are fruitful fields for study. And my study um, will be about individual volunteers, the, an individual group of volunteers, and I'm looking at the experiences and consequences area for both of those. Another framework for volunteering um, has come through Haskey, Leventhal, and Bargle. And this acknowledges that there is no one act of being a volunteer. There are stages that you may go through in the volunteer process. So you join a volunteer program, you become socialized within the program, um, and the stages nominee, new volunteer, emotional involvement, and established volunteering, and then potentially retirement. But what was really important for me in this work as I analyzed the data was the fact that um, there are transition periods, accommodation and affiliation, and those actually showed up in, my, in the interviewees that I, that I worked with. So we'll see that as it goes, comes along. So a little bit of a lit review in terms of the research on volunteering. There is a fair amount of survey research on volunteering. Um, and this conflates three studies on environmental volunteers in restoration, in outdoor recreation, um, and this was all done through surveys. So the top two in, in all three of these studies, the top two factors that came out about what people say they motivates them to volunteer were helping the environment and sociability. Other factors being outdoors, enhancing career, learning, 
good program leadership and well-organized projects. So there is a, there are a few qualitative studies on volunteering in the research literature and those focus on instead of motivation, those focus on how people construct meaning from their volunteer work. In other words, what it means to them in a deep way. And uh, this is, these are two studies, Haskey Leventhal and um, also Gooch. And Gooch did is the only environmental volunteer study that I found that looked at meaning. And this was published in 2002. And this is really, um, and, and what Gooch found is that people in environmental volunteer groups uh, raise their ecological consciousness, identify with a specific place, and have feelings of belonging. Haskey level thought, Leventhal and Barger looked at volunteers in a social welfare setting and they had other variables that made meaning for people. Training, commitment, rituals such as formally entering the program um, and building relationships. So the purpose of my research so we can understand the elements that go into program sustainability, volunteer program sustainability. I wanted to look at how members of a park volunteer program construct the meaning of their service and how this construction of meaning relates to the sustainability of the park volunteer program. So this is where the meaning and the sustainability come in. So what is qualitative research? It's a set of empirical methods for gathering and analyzing data, but it's also really a frame of mind or a philosophy of approach that values the, particip the participants' worldviews and, ex and experiences. So in this kind of research, we let the participants tell us what they think is happening to them, what they value. We don't give them a, a checklist of things to say, yes, this is good, this is good, this is somewhat good. It's not like that. And this is the kind of research that I wanted to do. I wanted to interact with people. So the structure of the study. So I used case study methodology to gather data on members of Park Volunteer Program, how they construct the meaning and, and importance of their contribution to the park's mission. I used data from semi-structured interviews and I analyzed it through grounded theory methodology. And this will, th I'll show you what that looks like. But first I want to tell you about the study site. So it's a park in the California Park System, California Department of Parks, and the overall, um, the overall mission of the park is to provide for the health, education, and inspiration of the people of California. And that is broken down into three submissions to preserve the state's biodiversity, to protect the natural and cultural resources, and to create opportunities for high quality outdoor education. And if you look at those, particularly if you're an environmental studies major, you might think that some of those are a bit contradictory to each other, that preservation and protection might sometimes conflict with outdoor recreation. So just a, just a thought. The park that I chose um, was Wilderness State Park in the greater San Francisco Bay Area. This park has had several threats to its existence in the last few years, and I think that's important to look at in terms of overall um, concept. One of the threats is the 2012 budget crisis, the state budget crisis where parks, 80 parks were put on a closure list, and Wilderness Park was one of those, and so the volunteer program clearly was affected by the, the threat of the park being closed. Um, and that led to a, a deal of, a great deal of uncertainty, which s still kind of exists in shadow form to this day. And it also led to understaffing, and that definitely exists to this day. 
Another threat that the park has had is because it's in an urban area is the threat of development pressure. Wilderness State Park is one of the largest California state parks. It has a headquarters section, sector, the back country, and that includes a state designated wilderness area. So 90% of the park is in the back country. 10% is the headquarters where the visitor center is, where there are easy um, trails where you can take your kids on a hike or your grandmother on a hike. Um, and also, there is some rugged area in the headquarters sector too. So if you want, a, you want to do 1,400 foot of elevation change in a repeated fashion, you can do that in the headquarters sector as well. There are four park rangers, three park aides, and 135 members of the uniform volunteer program in this park. And in 2015, Volunteers provided 17,437 hours of service to the park. So what did they do? They staffed the visitor center, they maintain trails and springs, they plan and staff big um, annual events, several annual much anticipated in the local community events and those are revenue generating events too which I think is an important point. They do um, visitor safety with trail patrol, they offer interpretive programs for children and for park visitors um, and it's important for what we're going to talk about today to know that they wear uniforms, the volunteers wear uniforms. Okay. And they administer the uniform volunteer program too. So they are not overseen by a bevy of park staff. There is one ranger who is the volunteer coordinator, but that ranger um, is, I would say, mostly works on an advisor, in an advisory capacity and the volunteer committee, which is made up mostly of volunteers, actually runs the training and and manages the volunteer program in many ways. So there's a great deal of autonomy there. <clears throat> the Uniform Volunteer Program is a really great um, study group for two reasons. And one is the investment in training, the investment in volunteers actually, and one is longevity. So investment in volunteers really manifests itself through the training program that people go through if they want to volunteer at that park. First you have to go through an interview, a sit down with the committee interview to get admitted into the program. And then there's a two month a four month training period in the classroom and in the field. And the field training program is a weekend um, overnight in the back country and in the wilderness to get to know that area of the park. There's also specialized training um, and as well as this investment in training and the volunteers, there's the, there's the longevity of the program itself and the longevity of some volunteers. So the program was founded in 1980 and there are still a few volunteers in the program who entered in the mid 80s. I don't think there's anybody from 1980, but there are people who've been um, volunteering since the mid 80s and this gives a certain um, stability to the program. So my study sample. So I did a purposive sample and that means that I selected um, interviewees, I invited interviewees to serve a certain purpose in my, in my research and I was looking for variations in longevity so I wanted people who were new to the program, people who had served for many years and, and some range in between. I wanted to do a gender balance as much as possible. Um, there are more men than women in this volunteer program, which is a bit unusual for volunteer programs, but maybe not so unusual for an outdoor volunteer program. I also wanted people from different service venues because someone who works at the visitor center or who leads an interpretive hike may have different ideas 
ideas of what works for them than someone who uh, maintains trails or springs. And I wanted to see if um, I, could, I could see anything that worked with that. And then I also looked for um, the factor of race and ethnicity, but I have to tell you that the volunteer program of 135 people, there's really no data. We have not uncovered any data on exact race, ethnicity, background, but I would say that possibly there are seven people in the program out of 135 who are African American, Hispanic American, or Asian American. So the, the ethnicity, it does not match the, the local community. And here's the breakdown. I'm not going to actually go over too much of this, but this is how things broke down. So, data collection. I collected data through 18 confidential, semi-structured interviews with current members in good standing of the Uniform Volunteer Program. Good standing means that you contribute at least 50 hours a year to the program. And that resulted in 29 recorded interview hours. So first of all, this shows you that 18 people, 29 hours, many people talked with me for longer than an hour. There, we had some long, in-depth interviews. And then um, the interviews were professionally transcribed, and I had 18, 788 pages of interview transcript to look at. So again, long interviews mean in-depth stories of how volunteers construct the meaning of what they're doing. And this is actually, these bullet points are what I use to structure the interviews. So I didn't ask yes or no questions. I didn't really ask questions. I just asked people to talk about their experiences with volunteers, visitors, or rangers or talk about cultural diversity within the program, or talk about leadership within the program. So these are all the talking points that I did. And people told me all kinds of stories. So we'll see some of what the people talked about. So that's the interviews, the interview schedule. And then I began, after the first five interviews, I felt like I had enough data to begin doing what is called coding. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to talk you through this chart briefly, and then I'm going to show you what it looks like on the ground. Because this is, I think, I always like examples myself, and so there will be an example of what this actually looks like. So the first thing when you, you have a, a transcript of an interview, you can do line by line coding, which is incident coding. And I'll show you an example of that. And then you have several incidents that that come up and some themes keep reoccurring in those incidents. So through the five original um, initial interviews, I, some themes did begin to come up, like working with park visitors, for instance. And then eventually, on down the line, those, those concepts that came up actually become strong and overarching themes that emerge from your data. And you'll hear in a minute or two about what mine were. But this is what it looks like. <clears throat> so this is a transcript. I use the pointer. And my prompts are in the bold print. And the interviewee's response is in the non-bold print. And so I asked, or I said, what would, would you describe some experiences working with the public? And then the interviewee said, just this last weekend where we had parents bring their little kids out to play with their mountain bikes. It's very rewarding to see you know all those little smiley faces because they're just having a great time. And then watching the reaction of the parents seeing their kids having a good time. So I learned quite a bit in just that that one section, I learned quite a bit. And when I uh, did the initial coding, the line by line coding, I said, not really profound, but I said, feeling rewarded by helping kids have a great time and parents too. And then the interviewee went on to say, for some families, they just haven't been in the park before, so it's nice to see them. 
and having a positive experience. Nice to see them having a positive experience. And I coded getting families into the park for the first time. So by the time I'd gone through five of them, I realized that many interviewees were talking to me about working with park visitors or some experience with park visitors. So I then went back and did my second round of coding. And this is my code for visitors. And that's my color for visitors, too. So I was having fun with my, my um, colored markers on this. And then you can see from this, this one that this is about um, volunteers and rangers working together to develop new programs in the park. So first I line coded it, and then I coded it rangers, and then I coded it working together. And then at the very end, Rangers became subsumed under working together and it was really about working together with Rangers and I didn't need a separate code for Rangers and so that is the progression that we see in this and that's exactly what it looks like. And here's my desk. So I used colors, and then at the, at the top of each, at the first page of each transcript, I wrote down exactly what themes came through in that transcript, and I used sticky notes to remind me of um, other things that I was looking for. I really um, spent a lot of time with all that paper. I also used InVivo, which is a qualitative data system, but the only real way I used that was after I had completed the coding and I was writing the draft thesis and I wanted to find examples of leadership or learning or when people talked about various things, mountain lions. I really wanted to get some good quotes about mountain lions. Unfortunately, I didn't, but you know, so I was searching for various things and that's how that works. On the bottom, you can see the transcripts lining up and then you can sort them by number of instances. So this person had 17 instances of the word learn or learning in their transcript. So, okay, so what happened from all of this? What happened is I found three strong themes. One was connecting with the environment, one was working together, and one was helping others. Oops. So connecting with the environment was the strongest theme. And it was strong because it had many different facets to it that all actually came down to connecting with the environment. And it was strong because people talked about it in a emotional, they imbued it with emotion. So I'm only going to tell you a few of the sub-themes. One was amazing nature spirituality, environmental learning, environmental stewardship, and deciding to volunteer. So now I'm going to start to read to you some of the things that people said in their interviews. A lot of people go to Wilderness Park just to visit that swimming spot in the creek. I think it's amazing because it's basically an oasis. I went there last year before I decided to volunteer. That's important. And there was still water in it and there was fish and turtles and wildlife in it. So this person really connects with nature in a personal way. Spirituality, so here are some people who connect with the natural world in a spiritual way. There's a spiritual element to go into the park and going into the wilderness by yourself and finding that spiritual experience with the universe. And another person said, I think for me going to Wilderness Park is I'm finding God and maybe nature in terms of the science of nature. So environmental learning was a big one and dear to my heart too. So here's someone who um, is a college student and this person says, I picked springs for volunteering because I was interested in the hydrology of the region. And that's what I really want to do with my college major. So it was interesting to learn how the springs worked in the park and how the type of geology helps transport water through the rocks and dirt and it comes out filtered. 
So here's someone who had taken some classes but had not learned this in their classes and this person learned it on the ground through training at, at the park. Environmental learning too. So a large wildflower wildfire went through the park um, a number of years ago and it burnt over half of the park and um, this was another very disheartening thing for park visitors, park staff and, and volunteers but here's something that came out of it. You might remember I mentioned that during the training period that um, the trainees went out into the wilderness and had an overnight camp out to learn about the back country. Well, that camp out happened to be in an area where the burn had gone through a few weeks before, so they camped in a burned area. And this is what one person remembers about that. There was no wildlife out there, no birds. But fire is a very important part of the natural cycle. And they, meaning the trainers, the volunteer trainers, they were able to use that to teach us new volunteers about the importance of what fire does. Of clearing out brush, burning off dead wood, providing different habitat as well as the nutrients that come from the ash. Now environmental learning often leads to stewardship and one of the of the outcomes of working in the park I found was developing a more sophisticated um, definition of stewardship for yourself and here this is um, I would say an example of that in process. When I say stewardship I mean it's a love of the park in the context of being a volunteer there, a desire to share it and help other people enjoy it and yet a sense of preserving it as well for future generations. So there's always a balance between having public access in an area and preserving it. And then there was a bit of a hesitation and this person said, they're kind of, you know, opposing. So this person is working out their ideas on that and that really harks back to the three missions, the tripart mission of the park as well. So back to the fire. Here's something else that happened with that. A volunteer organized a fire study to document and record recovery in the landscape after the wildfire. 30 volunteers went out to locations in both burned and unburned areas with the GPS and over time to see how the landscape recovered from the fire. Hugely valuable thing to do. So first of all, many of the volunteers thought the wild, that the fire was a disaster. And instead of living with that, someone created a study, recruited volunteers to go out and find out that, okay, regeneration happens, this is a good thing. And then they could, those volunteers could talk to park visitors when they met them in the visitor center or on the trail about this fire as not being a disaster. So really good stewardship. The last thing that I would tell you today about the, um, the connection with the environment is deciding to volunteer. So many, many interviewees, I would say at least half of the people I interviewed said that they came to the park as a visitor and they decided they wanted to do more in the park and they decided to do that, they would become a volunteer. Here's what someone says, I didn't even know about the volunteer program but I knew about the park because back in the late 90s I was doing horse packing trips back into the wilderness area, way back in there. And at that time there were no signposts, there was nothing. You can see a real feeling for this, no signposts and nothing. I decided, you know, I'll try this volunteer program and that was 16 years ago. So this person is now playing a leadership role in the park and is a continuing volunteer. So that was connecting with nature as a major theme and the second major theme is working together. And would someone please tell me how I'm doing on time? Is, I've been talking for 30 minutes, is that correct? Okay, thank you. So working together was also a very strong theme, not quite as strong as the connecting with the environment, but strong. And it had factors of working with other volunteers, working with rangers, and finding my niche. Okay, so this 
person talks about working in a group and this is an event in the back country and this person is doing parking detail and parking detail is probably one of the least popular um, volunteer jobs that exists and let's let's just see what this person says about that so I end up doing parking at the back country camp out when the parking is done, I go help wash dishes. Well, another probably least, except if you want to get your hands warm in the, in the cold. But, um, and then the person says, the fun part is you get to work with people that are enjoying it as well as I am. So it's always fun to work with others and you become part of a team. And notice I didn't say, were you ever, did you ever feel like you were part of a team? This is springing directly from these um, interviewees. And then the same person becomes a little more analytical and says, it's about collectively getting a job done and camaraderie that goes with that, encouraging others to help get it done. And the output of it is a successful event that everybody is pleased with and that they enjoy. So not only is my working in this group a good, um, a good way to be to be working together in a com camaraderie-ish fashion. Um, it's also a good way to help people enjoy the park. Working with park rangers. Now, people did talk about really appreciating um, and respecting the park rangers and the job that they did. The park rangers are peace officers. They're first responders. Um, and they have great knowledge of the natural history of the park. And here's what someone said. Rangers are a primary source of information in the visitor center when they're around. That is what worries me at times. Often I'm working by myself or with other volunteers in the visitor center and there isn't a ranger within miles. And they're available by radio, but still long ways away. So if there's an emergency, I worry about that at times and how to handle that. So this came up several times when people were talking about working at the visitor center. Um, and I think that it's a, it's a sticking point and a problem due to the, the staffing problems in the park, but it has an impact on vol the volunteer experience. And the last thing in working together is finding my niche. And what that means is that after training is over and you learn about all these great things you can do in the park, then you need to find your way to where the hub of those things exists. And um, some people, I had some really great um, people describing how they actually did that in a very organized fashion. And then there were some interviewees who just had great difficulty with that and spoke in frustration about that. Nobody actually presented me a menu and said, here's the list of everything going on in the park. You kind of have to dig them out on your own and find some things on your own. And then I just wanted to show you how people define niche. It's not just whether you do trail patrol or trail maintenance. It's also, um, as people said, activities beyond my paid job, activities you are interested in. Someone called finding your niche a blessing, and another called it something of value to do. So it's, it's the work, but it's a, f a feeling about that too. Helping others is the third theme, and it has elements of sharing the park with visitors and helping visitors stay safe. I'm not going to go into that theme. I think two themes is probably enough for this. And this was actually the weakest theme, which I think I need to continue to work on. So we're just going to move on to what this all means in terms of sustainability of the volunteer program, because we're interested in keeping that volunteer program going. So in terms of analyzing, Analyzing the data in that way, I turned to a paper by Schnell and Hoof, and they outlined the qualities that go into making meaning, the attributes that go into when humans make meaning. And they call them, and I will explain these in just a moment, coherence, significance, directedness, and belonging. Did the volunteers display these? So coherence would mean that volunteers' personal values uh, are or become coherent with park 
values or CDP values. And here's just an example. Someone says, I love hiking, I love the outdoors. And then they say, I enjoy helping visitors find destinations, helping them understand what they're getting into when they hike out into the park. So clearly we can see that coherence there. Significance is another attribute. So volunteers work is vital to continuing park operations in several areas including the all important visitor safety and event management and at least half of my interviewees probably more said this to me. Without volunteers there would be no park. It must be a little it must be a slogan up there because I heard so many people tell me but it has a and you can tell this from what I've been saying there's a, a clear ring of truth in that. And also clearly that indicates as a volunteer up there I am significant to the running of the park. The third factor in uh, making meaning would be directedness and that has to do with a um, adherence to a hierarchy of goals and regulations. Not a certain hierarchy, but being able to work within a hierarchy of goals and regulations that matches the organizational structure. So um, clearly within California Department of Parks, within Wilderness Park, and even the Uniform Volunteer Program, there is a hierarchy of goals and regulations. And one volunteer said, you're a member of a volunteer organization. You are required to follow state rules and requirements. So people to, to, to work well and to be able to make me meaning need to be able to do that. The last um, element of making meaning, according to Schnell and Hoof, is the element of belonging. And this came through loud and clear in the interviewee's comments, particularly about what it means to wear the uniform and also in their willingness to recruit. So going back to Schneider and Emoto, um, the researchers that I, met, I mentioned earlier, they, um, they say that willingness to recruit other people into the program is definitely a strong factor in belonging. So here's what someone said about wearing the uniform. Actually two people. You're a symbol of the park. And so if you're going to be a volunteer, you wear your uniform. You present yourself in a manner that makes the park look good. So you belong to the park. And one person came and said it outright. The uniform makes me feel like I belong here. So what is the takeaway on all of this? And how does it relate to um, sustainability of the program? So some of the strengths that foster that stability, sustainability are number one, volunteers identify with the overall volunteer program. Volunteers feel their, feel their contribution is vital. And volunteers value the opportunity to learn because learning is a way of integrating into the values of the park and the park system itself. We uncovered we, I showed you two problem areas today as well that I would say have a bit of an undermining factor but not an overwhelming undermining factor and that is the, the problem with finding a niche in the volunteer program once you've gone through training and the short staffing. There are some limitations on this study and the, the uniform volunteer program doesn't necessarily represent the cultural diversity of park visitors or some other outdoor volunteer groups. The study sample is diverse in age, gender and type of volunteer work but may not reflect the experience of other uniform volunteer park, uh, other uniform volunteer members who I did not interview. Uh, I was a, a 
a volunteer in the program. I went through the training and I did service for a period of about 14 months. Once I started analyzing my data, I stopped volunteering because the only data I really wanted to analyze was the data from the transcripts, not what I observed while I was working in the park. So I was not doing participant observation in this and in order to remove myself from what I had learned about being a volunteer, I went through the interview. The, I did an interview, a mock interview, using the interview schedule. That's one of the practices that you can do to become a reflexive researcher. And I did uncover some um, ideas that might have contaminated my analysis had I not gone through the interview um, myself. Selected references, I'm a librarian, so there's lots of them, that's just a few. And my deepest appreciation to my committee, starting with Dr. Dustin Mulvaney, Dr. Amy Lessingring, and Mr. John Thatcher, who really helped me get through this process. Everybody had really strong strengths in, in different ways, in the environmental studies field, the methodology field, and the, the park itself and what things meant. Also, I want to thank out loud my children, my two sons, Emil, who's sitting right here, and Dean, and my daughter-in-law, Adrian. They handheld me through a lot of this. It was wonderful, and they all know what it's like to go through an advanced degree program, so they were good at that. All my friends, my family, my fellow volunteers, um, and environmental studies students, without you, no thesis. <laughs> Thank you. So as the protocol is for a defense, we're going to lead with questions from the committee um, before opening it to the rest of you. We have a, a nice chunk of time here to... How did I do talk. in terms of time? Wonderful. Wonderful. Right on, right on target there. Um, so, John, do you... Uh, Want to leave with any questions? I, I certainly could leave with a question. Why don't you? Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll start then. Um, so I'm, I'm struck by something that came up twice in the talk, and we've talked about it a little bit, um, which is the, the, the fact that the volunteer composition doesn't reflect the community. Correct. So what can be done to uh, you know, cultivate diversity right. and volunteerism in in Wilderness State Park, I, mean, I could ask maybe, I'll ask another question a little bit about you know, thinking about generalizing to other volunteers, but right. maybe in this particular case, what can be done to, to bring kind of a, a more you know, a, a more richer experience perhaps right. to all these, by you know, interacting with other people? Well, they did call it working in a monoculture. I didn't include this, but I did mm -hmm. put it together. Um, what I found is that people acknowledge the fact that cultural diversity, am I, should I move back over here? Okay, that cultural diversity would be valuable in that setting because the surrounding community definitely has cultural diversity and the park does attract visitors who are, um, who are diverse. They come from a long ways away sometimes too, but no one, and then people would say, my interviewees would say, but I don't know what to do about this. Or, I am not a member of that community, so it really should be someone who's a member of that community to, to address that. Well, I think that there needs to be um, a recruitment strategy that would include recruitment methods for people of different, of, for pe for people to to <clears throat> to 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 augment the mix of cultural diversity in the park, I personally don't know what the recruitment strategy would be, but I think they're definitely that it needs to be addressed at the level of the volunteer committee. Now, the ranger did tell me that the state would not pay for signs in language other than English. So I think that this is a systemic problem in a way that 
might be hard to fight, but the National Forest Service has done lots of uh, research on attracting people, diverse people, into national forests in California. There's a whole volume on activities that are done to attract visitors, and I think that might be a good way to start is to attract visitors and then to make a point of, of talking with visitors about the volunteer program. Good job. Thank you. So you had talked about reflexivity as and potentially your um, engagement in the training um, program as a potential bias or weakness. Correct. So in, and as you know, uh, a lot of times um, that's a seen in this type of research as a strength or a, a, or a hallmark or an advantage on some level. Could you talk about maybe how a little bit about how you feel that you're actually going through the, the program itself was an advantage to your project? Well, it certainly gave me a background on the thinking about the intent for, of the volunteer program. So I learned that, whereas it was more of a meta Meta, um, meta level in terms of what the volunteer program is about. And also it gave me a, a more behind the scenes idea of what some of the issues and the problems were. Um, so I could hear that, so I, so I would know how to, to listen to people or maybe do a prompt from that. Um, how else did it strengthen what I was doing? Well, I worked side by side. I, I, I'm having trouble answering this question, but I'm just going to throw out a few things and maybe I'll have to think about it. So I worked side by side with several of these people. So not only did it give me access to the kind of people who I wanted to interview, but working side by side with them, I did pick up something. I'm sorry, Amy, I really can't. I, I would need to actually think about this. What do you think? I think that, uh, well, I'll ask you, um, do you think that that helped um, people trust you to even agree to be recruited yes. in the interview process and yes. be able to, to be willing to disclose information to you maybe or talk to you about things that they wouldn't to a stranger because they know that you, have, you, that you did have this history? Uh, you know, an experience and background with the, with the program. Okay, so thank you for helping me with that. Um, yes, I think it did. I think, and I did talk with the volunteer committee early on and I presented myself to them as wanting to do this and they did not have to give me an endorsement. I did have to get an endorsement from the park itself, but I wanted to get an endorsement from the volunteer committee and know what the volunteer committee wanted to learn. So yes, I think the familiar and my willingness to do volunteering and my eagerness to learn about volunteering, I think that that did, um, that did give me maybe an advantage in terms of people being willing to talk about. You were an insider of sorts. Really? I was. Yeah. You're right, I was an insider. It was somewhat of an uneasy role for me, though, to be an insider and then to have to step back and then to have to quit volunteering um, while I was doing the analysis. So it was, it was, you know, you have to juggle things and you have to keep that juggling going, right? You. Yeah, you're welcome. Lynn. That is really great. The last time I saw you, where was it? Oh, no. Wilderness State oh, Park. I was there at the park. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I live um, so, um, so the, the, the people that you interviewed are, were volunteers and, and continuing volunteers, um, and they can give you their perspective on what is keeping them there. I was wondering if you asked them if they knew why people who were volunteers might have left. I didn't ask them that question, but I did ask what things would make you want to leave. So there were some people who had left, but the only ones I heard about were people who were dismissed and not left to volunteer. Dismissed, that was only two instances. Dismissed or retired. And then people did not have any real 
<laughs> any real, re any real solid things except for this ranger, this gap in the ranger service about working in the park. They said, if I don't like this, I can always go do this because it's a very varied, it's a varied organization. So there was, I can't really, I can't really report any data about about why people leave. And I know that would be hard to get, but it'd be interesting to know um, from the standpoint of how it Well, I would guess that there are people who leave after a year or two, decide it's not for them for one reason or another, and so they were not they were, they were not part of the study, right? That's another kind of study. Yeah, good question. Justin. So those of us in, who work in higher education experience a similar uh, situation that the parks experience, which is kind of a, a, a mandate, an underfunded mandate. Underfunded mandate. That's essentially, right? So I guess in your... I, I, it's clear from the quotes and, and even your kind of the, the, the continual uh, repeating of this without volunteers, there is no park. Um, was there ever any kind of disdain for Sacramento or, you know, or the taxpayer? Well, in, in trying to understand why, why isn't, what, how can we bring in more funding? So it's not, at, I mean, I understand the, the, the rich experience of the volunteers, but that all depends on people's willingness to do that. And in some ways, it kind of makes up for the kind of hollowing of state funding for things that the state wants to promote. Right. Whether it's wilderness preservation or the experience of nature. So is that something that comes up in these conversations? Yes, but not in the way that you mentioned it. What comes up is, is active advocacy for the park in relation to crisis, including the budget crisis and the threat of closure and other and development pressures people in the in the volunteer program activist people in the program banded together addressed this in Sacramento as lobbyists and also donors donated money to someone donated $200,000 who was a volunteer for the keeping the park open so instead of bad-mouthing things that are going on, which I suspect that goes on in day-to-day -day working together when you're maintaining that spring. Maybe you do say something about that. What came through in the interviews was this, let's go out up there and advocate for our park. Yes? There were 135 volunteers and you interviewed 18. Yes. Were there more people that you approached that they declined to be? Yes. Interviewed? Mostly they just didn't answer. No one actually declined. Um, I approached 26 or 27 people. And, and if they didn't want to do it, they just didn't answer the question. However, at the annual meeting in January, most of them came up to me and said, I couldn't answer your email for this or that or the other reason. So after the fact, they did, I mean, they were kind about it. But yes, indeed. Let's open this up. Yeah, where everybody feel free to, to ask questions. So I have uh, two questions. OK. Not, not that intense. Um, so I was just curious, uh, you had said that um, uh, you did your volunteer, like, so basically, when when you did your your actual interviews, when you, when you yes, that, was that before you did your volunteering, or did, had you already been volunteering and then you did your survey? So I I joined the program, I got to know people, I asked for permission to do this, and then I started interviewing, and then I started analyzing, and then I stopped volunteering. So the stopping volunteering happened after I had done that first five um, interviews. Oh, so you did five interviews, then you stopped, and you continue with the remainder of the... Right. Because after the first five, I felt I could start to analyze. Yeah. And then my second question was just um, knowing what you know now, looking back, like, what would you do different? 
what would I do different? I wouldn't agonize over it so much. I mean, it was all new to me. Every step of the way was something I'd never done before. And so this next time I do this, I'm going to know what I'm doing a little bit more. I don't know that I would do, I'd have to think about that a little bit. It, I don't know, it seemed to fit me very well in terms of how I want, like saying that it's an approach, that qualitative methodology is an approach. It fit me really well. I'd like to do more, but I have all this data now. I don't have to go out and interview a bunch more people. I can analyze this data in different ways. But perhaps what I would want to do is well, the working together, I don't know if I've mentioned this, but the working together I have not found in the literature. That was one of the main themes, working together. It does not appear to be in the literature of why people volunteer, and so I'm definitely going to turn that into something publishable. Yeah. Have you thought about where? Not yet. I am going to take a little time off, and then I'll think about where. <laughs> right. Yeah. Just a comment on yes. that, just to follow up with that. Um, I noticed, too, that when you were talking about the strengths, I think it was the strengths of, um, or the take, on, the, on the takeaway slide. Yes. Um, it seems like that, yeah, could you, okay. The, oh, okay, the strengths that foster sustainability. It seems like what's missing is that, that working together piece or that sense of community that people, um, found there, you know, like-minded people who are, and the, so I would, I would think about that as well, because obviously that this program offers people a way to make those types of connections. Right, yeah. right, that's a good idea. Just in reaction to that, it was very interesting to me, um, people would say something like, oh, I think of all these volunteers like family. And I would ask, well, do you see them outside volunteering? No, they don't see each other outside. So it really is that working together part. They don't go to the movies together or go for a walk outside. So you are, th are, are saying to me that one of the strengths is this working together construct that is so meaningful to the people. OK, good, thank you. Thank you. That's the, always the dangerous question, um, which is that uh, you've done a case study here. Yes. And you recognize the limitations of generalizing to other right. volunteer efforts. Um, I'm, I'm curious if this was an urban park. It is not I'm an. I ask you to speculate, but it, oh, if uh, it were, if, if you were to study volunteerism in an urban park, right. would the ranking of what you you kind of have a weighting on on what right. things emerge. Do you see any of those maybe moving around? I don't know, but that's, how did you know what I want to do next? Uh, well. the, the bottom, it would be interesting to look at volunteers and long-term restoration projects or urban forestry green space groups, and I would have exactly the same question. So because Wilderness Park is a vast, multi-acred wilderness, it attracts people who like that space, who like going out there into nothing, no, no signs. There's nothing out there. Urban might be very different. So wouldn't that be an interesting contrast? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I, my, my own, I mean, my own little story to throw in here would be, you know, when I was a, a, a graduate student back in New Jersey, we took over an, an, a green space to turn into a community garden. Right, and, and in many ways that space wasn't so much about providing food or gardening, but about organizing, about you know the the blight zone, like the oh. blight that they're they're going to oh. make the whole neighborhood blighted and so oh. get rid of rent control. So in some ways, it kind of became this working together might have a different spin on kind of a, a space for community organizing. Right. Right. So, it yeah, might. Thinking about hypotheses for your future. Yeah, this is great. It, so you were asking about working together, not just the the findings. Um, as a whole. Yeah, so right, exactly. I can't answer that question, course, but no, no, I look forward to finding out. Right. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, Tina, I'm wondering if you have any plans to share this directly with the park itself. Or what you know, what you think would be the best way to do that? Yeah. 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 Yeah
program. Right. Well, I already shared very briefly just my intermediate findings at the annual meeting in January of the volunteer program. And I um, am going to talk with the volunteer committee about the findings that are, are relevant, particularly the cultural diversity, the ranger gap, but then also talking about the strengths that I uncovered too. Absolutely. I think they deserve, they deserve that, right? Yeah. Any questions? Okay, so I think at this point you can continue to field questions of the committee. We'll, we'll go outside real quick and, and have a conversation with that. Uh, the next steps. Thank you. I remember you. Yeah. Yes, I forget your name Diana. though. Diana, nice yeah. to see you again. Nice to see you. Yeah. Well. Sorry for my glasses. No, that's okay.